it's, uh, gives me great pleasure to be out here today um, telling you about something very close to my heart, um, my current research area, which is positioning smartphones indoors. Um, there's no real secret on my first slide as to why it's currently very close to my heart, and I'm going to share with you why it's worth a lot of cash here in 2013. Um, uh, Todd just kindly introduced me, but to give you a bit of my background, I, I worked after my PhD um, in the defense industry, building on my PhD. So the PhD was, um, what can I use in the environment around me to navigate without GPS? And there's lots of stuff, mobile phone signals, TV signals. Even if you've got the time, money, and space, and reason to do it, you can um, navigate pole to pole just using the Earth's gravitational field, if you know how. Um, and I worked on SERBs, um, UAVs, and cut my teeth on this robot car, which is like an angry version of the Google robot car. Um, this is um, tracking using medium wave AM radio. Uh, so this is 100-year-old technology. This is the stuff no one listens to anymore in their car radio uh, when they're driving around. But if you know how, you can get GPS-like performance for something that's over 100 years old. Um, this is digital TV, which has conveniently stopped running. Oh, there we go. Um, so fast forward to today, and, and digital TV can also be used with GPS-like accuracy if you know how. So that's tracking just using... Well, I was going to say a lot of uh, English references, uh, X Factor and uh, Fox News and stuff, navigation via uh, stuff you normally watch on TV. And this is an important part. This is machine learning. This is the system learning the locations of mobile phone masts that it didn't know anything about at the start as it drives around. So these ellipses here are collapsing down, and it's learning where the mobile phone masts are. And machine learning is, is becoming a very big part of opportunistic navigation, and I'll talk about uh, that a lot more in the talk. If you're interested in NavSub, which this all became, there's plenty of stuff on the internet about it. Um, the publicity that I got last year on this kind of stuff uh, culminated in Top Gear declaring me to be the real life Q, which is like everything Top Gear does, an extreme over-exaggeration of the truth. <laughs> but there is an interesting little link here. The real Q in the latest Skyfall, uh, uh, the latest James Bond film Skyfall, he gives James Bond two things, a gun and a tiny little radio tracking device. And that's it, no exploding pen, no flying car, and sure enough, when the chips are down and James Bond is about to be shot in the face by the bad guy, his little radio transmitter saves his life and the cavalry arrive and they rescue him. So even James Bond, when the chips are down, just like the rest of us, gets out his sat-nav. Um, so on that note, um, I'm going to do the first bit of um, uh, uh, crowdsourcing of my talk, since it's a big data talk. little show of hands. Who thinks they're currently being tracked right now, this very second? Who thinks that they are being electronically tracked? OK, I'm going to rephrase the question so that anyone with their hands down might be about to get a surprise. The answer is exactly the same. Um, who currently has mobile phone reception? So I do. You probably all do. Depends how deeply your phone is tucked away. But if you have mobile phone reception, then your position is known by your cellular network provider to anywhere between maybe uh, half a mile and a dozen miles. Um, it's the only way that your mobile phone works. Um, my wife, if she calls me right now, a lot of um, transmitters in Cambridge won't all start firing off looking for my phone. It'll be the local transmitter here. And it's because my phone number is currently on record live with my network provider, with the cell ID of the mast I can hear, and that is here in Austin, Texas. This is um, a, a track of someone being tracked using their mobile phone data. What's interesting is how long these records are kept. In the UK, these records are kept for a year. So my network provider, if I do something naughty and the police want to find out if I committed a crime or something, they can go back right back to a year to try to find out if I was where they suspected I was and stuff like that. So smartphones and positioning, well, phones, mobile phones, cell phones and positioning have always gone very closely tied together. And uh, we're now at a stage where we really want to move all of the benefits that we have from GPS indoors. So GPS is is now in everything. It's, it controls the telecommunications. Stock market is based on it. The food in our supermarkets is cheaper today than it would be without GPS because GPS has enabled things like precision agriculture, which has lowered costs. But we spend 80% of our time indoors, and there's lots of reasons why we want to bring all of these benefits into the indoor environment. Lots of people are interested in it, and um, let's have a look at why. So the traditional way of trying to do indoor positioning on smartphones is by a technique called fingerprinting, which was pioneered really by Skyhook. Well, in terms of commercialization, it was driven by Skyhook uh, about, starting about 10 years ago. It's a very big data set, as you can see. 
And the idea here is that you drive around and you sniff cellular masts, their signal strength, and you sniff Wi-Fi access points, IDs, and their signal strength, and you log it against position. You build up a big database and you provide this information to people when they need to. So based on the exact sequence of uh, uh, Wi-Fi MAC addresses and signal strengths that my phone is listening to right now, I can be positioned inside this auditorium. If I go into a different part of the building, the signal strengths will change, my position can be updated accordingly. And um, Apple and Google used to buy this off Skyhook. Then they tried to go it alone, and of course, there's patent battles and suing now going on. But both Google and Apple have stressed a number of times how precious um, owning their own ability to locate smartphone users is. So why? Why is it worth a billion dollars? Well, a large part of that is in advertising. Um, uh, the, the ability to target an advert to somebody at the right time, in the right place, is worth a lot of money. You can encourage someone to go ahead and just buy that thing. If you know they're looking at it right now and you know from other sources that they regularly look at this thing, I, you've logged their location a few times, maybe they just need that little push, that little 5% off voucher and they'll go and buy it. So there's lots and lots of, of reasons for, um, for driving indoor positioning based on advertising alone. Some of it has come from analytics. So there's a company in the UK called Path Intelligence and um, they have been developing a system to track shoppers around stores. So the gist is that you typically spend somewhere between half an hour and an hour in stores, uh, in a, say, a big department store. Only about 20% of people go and buy something. And those people, the stores know stuff about. They know what they bought. The 80% that just wander through the store, the bricks and mortar store, know nothing about them. They have no knowledge as to what they did. Online stores, however, know everything about everybody, whether they've paid for something or not. They know how long they looked at stuff, what they searched, where the mouse pointer hovered. Even now, it all links in with Facebook and Twitter. There's a direct correlation between people sharing and liking stuff on Facebook and then later them going and purchasing it. So the stuff you learn in the online world that can drive huge profits, people are now keen to bring it into bricks and mortar stores. Um, so what uh, Path Intelligence do is they stick um, receivers around the environment that sniff everybody's mobile phone data. So anytime you send a text message, uh, initiate a call, go on the internet, your phone uh, releases this packet of electromagnetic radiation that's unique. You can pick it up around the store simultaneously in different locations and work out where it was emitted from. You can then track the users. So from this, you've got really rich analytics. You start to generate heat maps um, of the stores. You understand footfall, where people go, the paths people typically take. You can see how long people, or how many people walk past certain advertising billboards against others, how much money, therefore, you should charge for those different advertising billboards, things like that. And um, this is starting to drive an understanding as to how much money you can make by tracking people as they go around stores, and then how much money you can generate by targeting them with information at the right time. And then, of course, there's going to be lots of applications, and this is where the young entrepreneurs in the audience um, will have the opportunity to really make their money. So uh, I've picked randomly here Google uh, uh, traffic, the fact that this stuff just comes naturally by so many people using Google for sat-navs. This data is all live. Um, this red line drawn here is being drawn because Google know right now that cars are moving very slowly on that stretch, cars using Google, uh, Google uh, Maps for sat -nav. So these kind of applications can come naturally too. Imagine um, deciding whether you're going to go shopping or not right now, whether you're going to bother to drive all the way to the supermarket. Imagine just zooming in on Google Maps, zooming in and in and in onto that supermarket, zooming in and in and in, and zooming in on the aisles in the supermarket and the checkouts and going red lines on all those checkouts. I'm going to go in a couple of hours. It's going to be, it's going to be possible. It's going to be a new application um, of indoor positioning. So why don't we have it yet? Well, the best way to get accurate indoor positioning today is to manually survey the environment. So go to all the locations, have a floor plan, poke your finger on the map, take the readings, and carry on. And it takes a long time, and it will not scale. The alternative is Skyhook's approach, um, and the approach that Google takes sniffing all of our um, uh, data as we use uh, Google Maps and stuff, which is people are driving around the streets, you can sniff all the Wi-Fi, and you can try to then extrapolate into the building and get a little bit of an idea as to um, uh, what you what kind of um, Wi-Fi signal strengths and access point lists they might hear just inside the building. But you're not going to be able to extrapolate that to kind of one meter accuracy, which is obviously the holy grail. So this is a bit of a, a problem. But there's a solution. And um, it was a very clever move from Apple in 
uh, April this year when they bought a little company of three people that had existed for about two years at the time called Wi-Fi Slam. And they paid $20 million for this technology. And what it is is basically an auto-surveying scheme. It's a way of allowing someone to move very quickly and quite freely through an environment and generating similar sorts of performance and survey as if they'd been manually surveying it. It basically takes a scruffy, rubbish attempt at the survey, one that was just made automatically as the person wandered around, and tidying it up. And this is the sort of true path that was taken. And as humans, we can look at that and go, well, yeah, it's probably supposed to look like that, so just squish this a bit, squeeze that a bit. So computers who don't have the Mark I eyeball that's taken millions of years to evolve um, and understanding of things like floor plans and corridors, it's actually um, a more tricky problem. It's one of the problems that I worked on in the defense industry. I've worked on flavors of SLAM, and I also have a SLAM-based smartphone positioning system, which I can show you. Mine runs in real time on a phone, unlike Wi-Fi SLAM, but anyway. Um, <laughs> let me just stop it here. Oh, rubbish. <laughs> Let's try that again. Um, let me try and pause it. Okay. So let me explain what you're looking at. This is the floor plan of a building. It's a, this building where I work, about 100 meters by 100 meters, so about um, 300 feet by 300 feet. Uh, it's for your pleasure only. The system did not know about walls and, and stuff like that. What's happened is the users come in from outside. While they were outside, the phone was in their pocket and had GPS. They were walking, and so the accelerometers in the phone could register this motion that looked like walking. And it could confirm the, from the GPS that there was indeed motion. And it can work out the step length. It can also work out if there's any error on the compass heading that the phone has. So if I'm holding the phone, or if it's in my pocket, or if it's in a bag, then the kind of compass heading the phone thinks I'm walking on might not actually be my true heading. And the GPS feed allows us to work that out. So very quickly, we can kind of calibrate the system. We can work out a step length and any kind of compass error. You go into the building, you lose GPS, and you freewheel on the accelerometer shaking motion and changes to your gyro smooth compass. And that will push this little red line around the building. And one of my colleagues um, at Cambridge, a chap called Rob Hall, works on making the red line as good as possible by doing things like trying to detect the type of step, back step, forward step, whether it's a fake step, stuff like this. The problem with the red line is it will always get worse with time. Every single step is based on the quality of the position of the last one. And all steps are slightly long or short, there's noise on the compass. So you'll see the red one get worse and worse with time. The green one is being clever. When we came into the building, we walked down here, we knew quite well where we were. Um, the phone sniffs the Wi-Fi, and it sniffs the magnetometer measurements as well, your compass measurement. So when you walk past a fire hydrant or a, a drinks machine or a, a large object, a printer in the corridor, you get a characteristic spike. And the same as if you go down that corridor next time, you can go, oh, fire hydrant, coffee machine, uh, photocopier, and back in Ramsey's corridor. Um, you can recognize the environment. The phone can too. It makes its own version of a view of the corridor, but with the magnetometer and the Wi-Fi. So it has a unique pattern that represents this corridor. What that means is when it comes back around and starts to move down here again, it can observe and correct any drift that has accumulated. So it self-corrects. It learns. It gets better with use. And you'll see as it runs through, it does a very good job of giving a realistic view of what happened, i.e. walking through the corridors, as opposed to the red one, which inevitably gets worse and worse and worse with time. That's SLAM. And that's worth $20 million to Apple. And you can see why. It is an auto-correcting uh, indoor positioning system that once you tap into crowdsourcing all of your users, you have a very rich way of very rapidly solving the indoor positioning problem. Apple then did something else neat. They jumped on the Bluetooth low energy bandwagon and they released support for what they're calling iBeacons. Now, um, Bluetooth low energy is going to be in lots of stuff. It's a very, very mature technology. It's been 10 years in the making. It's sitting on um, powerhouses like Nokia and Cambridge Silicon Radio. Um, it's going to enable lots of uh, low power, simple communication schemes. It's designed for things like pedometers to talk to your phone. It's designed for you to be able to stick a little tag on your keys so that if you ever leave them behind, your phone will go, do you know you're more than 15 meters from your keys? Maybe you want to sort that out. Um, that's what it's designed for. But because of the boom in indoor positioning and the advertising stuff, it's being jerry-rigged for tailored advertising. And this is the stuff you'll read. Microlocation, a term that I don't think existed about a year ago. Uh, indoor GPS, uh, wireless point of sale. And then you'll see stuff like this, two-year battery life, 300-foot range. Well, we can 
look at some facts and pick out what's truth there and what's hype. So I've already mentioned BLE is um, uh, not an Apple invention. It is an extension of Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy. It operates in the radio, uh, the, the Wi-Fi band, so it has the same propagation characteristics as Wi-Fi. So in terms of indoor positioning, it has the same issues with punching through walls as Wi-Fi does. It has the same problems with penetrating human bodies as Wi-Fi does. So it's going to be similar in terms of its abilities to do indoor positioning as Wi-Fi. Um, it is not designed to send adverts around. It's about 16 characters that this thing can squirt each time. It's designed to just send a number like a temperature measurement or a step count. It's not designed to send adverts. So in actual fact, all it's going to do is send little funny coded messages to smartphone apps, and smartphone apps will then run adverts, a picture, a movie, whatever. There's obviously a trade-off between battery life, the range you're going to get from the radio, and how often you're going to squirt your information out. And two years and 300 feet do not go together. Um, you can dial these things up to high power, but depending on what size battery you're going to put in the thing and therefore how big it's going to be, uh, you're, you're looking at um, minutes and, and hours if you're talking about maximum power broadcasts on very small batteries. So I have 18 BLE devices, and I've been playing with them ready for this talk. So this is my corridor. It's about uh, 40 meters, about 120 feet long by about 45 feet wide. This is a Wi-Fi coverage pattern here, and this is a BLE coverage pattern when set to what's going to be about a two-year lifetime. So as you can see, the coverage pattern is much smaller. Now, in, important points about indoor positioning. It depends on what you're going to call indoor positioning. If you would like to know your location freely throughout an environment, go anywhere you like in the environment and get a position update, then BLEs are not going to automatically give you that. You're going to have to put them everywhere because you're going to need lots of good overlap between lots of these little guys. Wi-Fi already, because of how much of a part of our society it's become, there's already good coverage from Wi-Fi. It already has good, lots of good overlapping sources. I've fired up my phone before, and I think there's sort of like five or six uh, Wi-Fi's that you can see in this room alone. Where um, BLE makes a big difference is in proximity measurement. So when you get right up close to a transmitter, you see a sudden spike in power. That means it's a very easy way of saying, I'm very close to this object. And so it's, it's really useful for is this person stood right in front of this uh, set of razor blades before I send them an advert and a voucher? And that is really what it's going to be useful for, just pushing those adverts. It's not going to be useful, really, for providing global um, positioning freely throughout a building unless you're going to stick these things everywhere. Just give you a quick idea of what fingerprinting looks like. Um, this is the true position of uh, a person, and this very funky looking thing is a probability distribution as to where they are according to the Wi-Fi fingerprint measurements. I won't run the BLE movie. It looks just like this one. You know, it's not 10 times better. It's not 10 times worse. Basically, it looks like this one. So whenever you get a little blue dot indoors, a nice little blue circle, um, what you're seeing is the kind of um, simple view of the kind of geek view, which is this one. So that's what's really going on when you're trying to do fingerprinting and work out where you might be based on radio measurements indoors. And I've got to now try to find my way back there. So some of the risks of iBeacons, um, they're designed to be mobile. And uh, they'll be all over the place. They'll be on people's shoes. They'll be in people's pockets, in their wallets, and their keys if they're using them to help them find lost stuff. They are going to be everywhere, and they're going to be mobile. So if you're going to survey an environment and try to generate fingerprints for indoor positioning, you wouldn't like to be able to identify the mobile and the static ones. Tough. You're not going to be able to. You, you'd be able to if you own the store and you know the ones that you've put down in the environment, but that's it. Someone might move the stuff around in your environment too. The point is, this is a thing that says you're currently stood in front of the bargain bin DVD section. Here, have, a, have a, an advert to do with our DVDs. Someone can then pick that thing up and move it to a new part of the store, and the iBeacon will move with them, and it will work perfectly well. But it would destroy, or at least weaken, a fingerprinting scheme that's using BLEs. So fingerprinting, I think, stick to Wi-Fi unless you own all the iBeacons in your environment or have set it up very carefully. But they're going to be brilliant for targeting adverts and coupons. Spoofing and spamming. OK. There's a real risk for iBeacon abuse. This is what an iBeacon message looks like. There's an identifier at the front. And then there's a little message, as I said, maybe 16 characters that you can squirt out. Right. The right way to use iBeacons is to have a coded message that your app looks for, looks at, and goes, right, I'm going to load this picture or this movie 
or do something with this little piece of information. What is a real concern is if people don't understand how to use this properly and put a tiny URL web link here. That is uh, going to be a disaster because your phones can be BLE beacons, your phones can sniff this stuff, and your phones can rebroadcast this stuff. So someone very malicious can very easily write an app which sniffs the iBeacons that are around, strips that, sticks their own tiny URL website in it, and pretends to be the legit store iBeacon. That could be very, very embarrassing depending on the malicious websites they're sending you to. So hopefully people will understand this before they start deploying iBeacons and making use of them. So BLE will definitely take off. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, if you're going to buy hundreds of these things, go and talk to Nokia or CSR because they're actually much cheaper than the ones that you're buying on the internet today with the really cool glossy websites and stuff. Um, I wouldn't use uh, mobile BLE. I wouldn't use BLE for fingerprinting. It's too mobile a technology, um, but it is it is definitely the right technology for poking someone an advert at the right time in the right place. And this, as always, security is being left till last. And um, I hope people uh, take note of that. Finally, I think the chap at the back will be very interested in this. Um, you can check out your own contributions to big data via Google. If you Google, <laughs> Google Maps Location History, or type all that in, then one of two things will happen. You'll either be bored and get nothing here, or you will get a calendar and a map. And you can click all the way back through your history and watch where you were when. It's revealing when Google is sniffing the Wi-Fi's and your GPS and your cellular stuff. Now, this is enabled because I was surprised when I came across this. At some point, in the last few years, I've gone into Google settings on my phone, I've gone into location settings, and I've ticked location history, and I've forgotten all about it. That is where I live. Maybe, oh, how much time have I got left? I won't do this live, maybe, maybe later. But play with this yourself, right? Not only is that where I live, you can zoom in on that, and there's a Wi-Fi fingerprint. You can put the satellite view on, and that is my house. No doubt about it. That is exactly on my house. This is where I work. And this is Queen's College where I teach. So this is very, very precious data. There's another one. Look. Oh, I'm currently in the States, right? So what's concerning to me about this, I think this is great that I can go into this and I can delete stuff, which is probably why Google have enabled this. What concerns me about this, I would love to get a text message every couple of weeks from Google saying, have you remembered you've left location history ticked? Do you want this? Because here's the concern, right? I walk away accidentally or for, because I'm dragged away in an emergency from a computer that I'm logged into, my Gmail's logged in, right? It's not that big of a disaster to me if someone reads my Gmail because I'm careful about what I use my Gmail for versus what I use my university mail address for. But with a couple of clicks, never mind harvesting my, e my emails and spending hours reading it trying to look for cool stuff, they can just go straight to this and go, that's where he lives, that's where he works, he's doing something else there. They can go to right now and see that I'm in the States. And they can zoom in on that and see my house. So uh, I was both amazed and terrified to some degree when I saw this. So um, uh, if anyone's from Google, please start texting people if this is turned on and remind them that this is turned on. OK, any questions? Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. dynamite panel session for you here, broadly themed, what's disruptive uh, about location analytics? And I'll just introduce the panel by saying, uh, is Jeff still here? <laughs> 